Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. And uh, this here is a big picture overview of the Lake Champlain Basin, um, looking from Camel's Hump to the west and that little sliver here, that is the Lake Champlain. And I remember that day when we hiked up there because I was stuck. Um, I love that you just talked about this because I was stuck or not sure if I was going to be stuck. My tenure file was floating around in the academic world. This was two years ago. And I was just thinking, what if this doesn't work? You know, what else can I do? I'm not good at anything else. <laughs> and, um, and it all worked out. Um, but I thought I will, before I talk to you about different scales in the critical zone in stream water carbon, I talk a little bit how I got there and um, how I kind of got to critical zone science. And so a lot of, maybe some people have a pretty straightforward trajectory from then at some point that probably for me was after high school um, to now um, being, um, let me just see and see stuff in the chat. I just want to make sure. Okay. Nobody is telling me that you can't hear anything. Okay. Um, so for me, that was not a straight line, finding my path to critical zone science. It um, kind of looked more like this. Um, I started out after high school thinking I really like art. I was going to do something with art. And uh, I applied to art school and did all kinds of work. And that didn't work out. So that was a change of plan. And I would say that every time I kind of had this idea that I'm going to follow a straight path, I did feel stuck. And then this change of plans finally helped to be unstuck. So then I thought I was going to do psychology because I'm really interested in people and um, I love to understand what motivates people and why do things happen. And so I did a ton of internships and that also led to a change in plans. And then I found geology and I always liked that mostly because I just liked volcanoes. But I started to study geology and then it really hit me. Um, and I got interested in mineralogy and for my master's also geochemistry and then for my PhD geomicrobiology and then later for my postdoc soil science and biogeochemistry and I'm kind of thinking that those squiggles will just continue like that. Um, and in many places, a trajectory like this is a very weird thing. However, all of those that are in that yellow bubble, they kind of are really part of critical zone science. And so we come together, many of us, with all sorts of trajectories that have all of these different perspectives and approaches and skills and combinations of that, that makes critical zone science so fun. And we couldn't, we couldn't just do it with a single one discipline. So I kind of warned you saying that I started out thinking I was going to do something with art. So I thought I'd go back to the beginnings and use a piece of art to kind of exemplify what I mean with this big picture and detail thing. And it might also fit a little bit with that left brain, right brain thing that um, was topic yesterday, because apparently the right brain can understand patterns much more than the left brain and the left brain can understand the details much better. But so in that context, um, this is a painting by Claude Monet and he was an impressionist painter who already knew about the critical zone. <laughs> it's right here. And um, when you look at this, um, what, what they tried to do really is all about capturing light. So the impressionist painters, how can you capture light in a painting? This is literally a big picture. But if we wanted to understand how that works, we would probably take a couple of steps closer and look to the detail. Like for example, the brush stroke, how exactly are they doing it? And once we understood that, it might be possible, you know, to kind of maybe one day try to do something similar. In my mind, um, we see patterns often in the big picture and the process often in the detail. So this comes with a challenge. 
And I want to talk about this bridging scales and the, the challenge of scale. So this here is a very blurry version of that um, painting by Monet um, because that's just keeping it real. That's very often how our data looks like. So when we use this, some kind of like a blurry broad understanding and want to understand a process and a detail based on that, very often if we take just one piece here and zoom in, all we have is something like this, which does not help us much more in understanding what is actually the process underpinning the pattern or producing the pattern that we see. In contrast, if we take a deep look at the detail and then just simply upscale it, all we get is something like this and it still doesn't help us. So I would argue that the really good stuff happens when we iterate between the two, between the big picture and the detail in a museum, standing all the way back from a picture and observing, then going closer, understanding something else, and then stepping back again and iterate a couple of times to hopefully end up here. So with uh, one project that I want to talk about today, um, we're doing this with Streamwater DOC, and it's really this approach of pattern to process. So going from um, really regional scale data um, to understanding a process, but then also going back from the process back to the pattern. And that is a project that is um, ongoing and NSF funded, combining complex systems tools, process-based modeling and experiments to bridge scales in low temperature geochemistry. And Lily, uh, your host today is um, part of that project. So dissolved organic carbon is, um, an important piece in that. And um, it's really important. It's also one of my favorite things. And I saw that Rachel Gabor is on the call and she was one person that was so instrumental to bringing dissolved organic carbon so much more closer to me um, when I did my postdoc at the Santa Catalina um, CD CZO. And so here I like this kind of schematic because it helps us to understand what we mean by dissolved organic carbon with all these other organic matter materials that we can have. Um, so the dissolve just means that it's operationally defined and it will pass a filter. And depending on what you do, that could be a 0.7 micrometer, 0.45 or smaller. So it's a really purely operationally definition. And um, in organic matter, you can have all sorts of elements. And yes, carbon is an important part, but you have nitrogen and phosphorus and hydrogen and oxygen and sulfur and so forth. So when we're talking about dissolved organic carbon, we really only look at that part that is carbon. And why it's important? Well, we know that we have too much carbon in the atmosphere and soils are really fantastic carbon store. That's three times the amount of carbon than it is in the atmosphere is stored in soils and we want to keep it there. However, um, soils are really easily flushed when we have a big precipitation event. A lot of organic material can be flushed into the streams and it's in the name, it's dissolved, so it goes where the water goes and it's very mobile. It's also very labile, it can readily be processed by microorganisms. And that is one important part where we could have a flux of CO2 back to the atmosphere. So it's important to understand what's going on with DOC. So since a long time, we know that dissolved organic carbon is changing in, in the streams. Um, and there's a lot of research, and these are just like half a percent of the publications that came out over a long time really look at this and it's like, what is going on? And um, I really like this paper because it also shows that scale and process understanding is really important. And a lot of times things that we feel, oh, these are patterns that are incom incompatible, they actually are not if you look at the right scale. So there's a lot of things going on and a lot of drivers can contribute to impacting how much DOC you have in the stream. I just wanna mention, changes in precipitation in this charge because as DOC is dissolved and as it's often flushed into the streams by soils, precipitation really matters. 
Um, also changes in temperature, all things organic have biology in there. There's a lot of reaction rates that are sped up by changes in temperature. Um, one aspect that found a lot of um, traction is acidification and recovery from it. And um, that's something that we look at also specifically in my group. And also land use change. And um, because in that specific project, we look only on uh, forested landscapes, this is not so much a thing, but overall is one additional driver for um, stream DOC. And then we have the critical zone. So when all these drivers meet the critical zone, what happens there? What is its impact? What are the, the attributes of this place that might actually change how it responds to a given driver? So this is um, the approach we take, kind of iterating between different land scales and time scales using specific tools and I'm going to talk about two main scales today. Um, the larger scales to just get at the patterns. And for this, we use a bunch of complex systems tools and then experiments to get at the smaller scale and try to figure out just maybe one or two processes that might contribute. So essentially, we're hoping to get to a clearer picture by iterating between those two. So for this, we need data. For the big um, regional scales analysis, uh, we use a data set that was published by Nance Adder and others, um, and it has catchment attributes and meteorology for large sample studies. And together, all of this makes a really cool acronym that led to a couple of confusions in early group meetings. Um, and what is in there is, uh, location and topography, climatic indices, hydrologic signatures, and so much more. So it's a fantastic data set for almost 700 catchments. And um, I also might want to say here, as I look at this, this looks almost like an impressionist painting. So this sort of makes sense. Um, what we did is we added onto this data set for the same catchments, um, stream water chemistry data, and atmospheric deposition data. And this is ready to go. And Gary Sterley and Adrian Harpole, they're um, spearheading this effort of um, our project and roll this out soon. So there's a lot of amazing data there and it's just there for you to start playing with it. So what we show here as an example is the length of record for a couple of um, water quality parameters that we have. Um, the larger the symbol, the longer the record going to back to over 20 years. And the darker the symbol, the more single measurements at a given gauge. So now there's a lot of cool data and why did we decide to study DOC? Because this is a really sparse data set and it's a very typical challenge that we have. Um, with big data. Um, but we do it anyway, and I'll show you a couple of tools that we use, and some of them are really well adapted to handle sparse data and unbalanced data. So to start with the pattern, the first thing that we did, and this is work by Kristen Underwood, um, she first said, well, let's look what, what the catchment attributes bring out anyway. So she used an hierarchical agglomerative clustering algorithm and just fed in all of these catchment attributes. There are um, around 50 of them and just see like what happens? Like, is there a pattern? And yes, there is a pattern and there, these attributes cluster mostly by eco regions. So we have the Pacific Northwest and the Intermountain, um, Intermountain West and the coastal regions and so forth. Um, and then we wanted to know where is the carbon in the streams? Where's the high concentrations? And here she used the uh, Jenks natural breaks just to have the data decide what do we mean? Where's the natural break between like low concentrations and the high concentration? What came out is that that breaking point is at around 4.6 milligrams per liter, which is really interesting because this is the very close to the average global DOC concentration of around five milligrams per liter. And the other observation is that the high DOC, and some of them are really crazy high, um, up to 30, 40 milligrams per liter, they are around hugging here the coast, but also around the Great Lakes. So that means that the catchment attributes 
just by themselves without a little bit more detailed look do not help us because the high DOC areas, the places where we need to pay specific attention, span a bunch of different clusters here. So then she used a tandem evolutionary algorithm, and that is a really cool tool um, for feature selection. And what this can do is, or what, what she did is she fed it all these attributes and says, work on this and tell me what needs to happen for us to get high DOC. So that's the outcome class. And you can think about this, like when you, I have, every once in a while I have headaches and I always wonder why I get them. And I realized, and it took me a while because I didn't have an evolutionary algorithm that does that for me, but that if I drink too much coffee, don't sleep enough, am stressed, and a weather change is coming, that's for sure I'm getting a headache. So that's kind of the type of combinations that that algorithm can figure out for you. And it does not only tell you what has to happen, but also how much of it. So it would tell me exactly one and a half cups of coffee and you're over it. So this is here, the conjunctive clause is this, and this and that together, okay? If you have a first order conjunctive class, that means you only need one thing to get a high DOC outcome. If you have a um, fourth order, you need the combination of four different things to make my headache. Um, but then there's also those disjunctive clauses. And these are excellent if you have multiple reasons that might be unconnected to produce that outcome. So it would tell you, yes, too much coffee, but also if you get hit on the head, would give you a headache. And for stream DOC, this is really important. So it's a very smart tool that gets at the complexity that we are dealing with, um, especially with big data. Um, it's not at all concerned when it has to test combinations for many, many attributes. So what we're looking for here is high precision, that means High DOC is really identified as high DOC and also high sensitivity. That means that we're not thinking something is low DOC when it's actually is high DOC. So we wanna be in this high area. And what we found is that this conjunctive clause was not all that helpful. It still gives us something, but um, we wanna be all the way high up in that solution. So that is that disjunctive clause. If you can have high DOC for very different reasons. So what we found with this um, as a first order, just we need one thing, and these names here are um, exactly how um, the catchment attributes are named in the Adora paper. So we kept that naming. You need deep soils. Um, and that's a little bit of like, duh, because um, soils produce a lot of DOCs for our streams. But um, much better the solution was for, I just sounded like Yoda, I realized. Um, the solution was much better for um, the fourth order disjunctive clause. That means you can have four different reasons or combination of reasons to get high DOC. So you could either have a very shallow topography or you could have snow dominance and also a very wet area. So this is a relatively high, um, mean daily precipitation, the maximum in the US is a little bit over four. Or you could have a very high precipitation frequency, so that's really event driven. Or again, you could have deep soils. And here we're getting much more specific because, yes, we would, we would re need really deep soils. So this is helpful and it gets at the pattern. But remember, this was only DOC concentration, the mean over this entire time. And also given that we can have all these different drivers for the same outcome, what we wanted to do is look at that pattern yet in a different way. We wanted to know, if, is there something that actually drives that change instead of just the average concentration? And also, can we restrict our analysis to something that, or to a place that has similar drivers so that we can dig a little deeper? So we restricted it to, to the Northeast where we have um, uh, recovery from acidification across the board that influences everything, but also changes in precipitation patterns. These are results from um, flow adjusted seasonal candle tests. So the flow adjustment takes out 
this control of discharge that we anyway would have because we're flushing so much DOC in the streams and it's a dissolved species. What we found here is that before the early 2000s, we had mostly increasing trends and the data set starts at around like um, the late 80s, mid 80s, um, either increases or no trend. Um, after the early 2000s, uh, we then saw that some places continued to still have a positive trend versus other places actually started trending downwards. We wanted to know what that role of the acidification is, and we correlated the directionality of that trend. So upwards would be a positive value, and downward trending would be a negative value against the directionality of the trend in sulfate deposition, and that's part of the data set. And what is interesting is that all these different places kind of follow um, some common rule about this. We also wanted to know the catchment attributes. We got a glimpse of from the evolutionary algorithm, but can we see this in our trends, not only the concentrations too? And that is interesting too, because here again, directionality of the trends is correlated against some of these catchment attributes. And we tested a lot of them, but the same ones that popped for the evolutionary algorithm popped here too. And what that means is, for example, places that have a negative trend since the early 2000s also tend to not be event-driven, right? So there's a lot of things that we're starting to unpack. I want to step now closer to the painting um, and take a look at the processes um, because why would something like acidification and recovery from acidification has anything to do with DOC in the streams? Um, so it's kind of, you know, we have a driver, we have our critical zone, our catchment soils, and then we have a response that driver could be acid rain. If we take the acidity out, we get DOC out. But I always think about this a little bit when we see things like this as um, in some of the old movies, comedies, where you close a trunk and the hood pops open and you close this and then one door pops open. Um, where, where is the connection in the process? So one reason for this is that DOC solubility is really pH dependent. And because water is a polar molecule, it really loves everything that has a charge. And if you have a higher pH, that means that you also have deprotonated functional groups and that increases the solubility. And DOC might come out. Another piece that we're investigating in my group is that aggregates and colloidal associations they're really good at clumping together um, at high charge density environments. And that is something you need when you have high ionic strength and low pH, both conditions during acidification, as opposed to reversing those conditions, lowering ionic strength, increasing pH, less protons in the water. These might actually um, separate, disaggregate, and um, whatever is then linked to those aggregates might come out. So to look a little bit closer at that process, specifically the aggregation, we now just go to two places in the painting really closely. So the one is um, Sleepers Rivers Research Watershed in Northern Vermont. And this has been pumping out DOC steadily and increasingly. And then Young Woman's Creek, in the past 15 years, a decreasing trend. And the soils that we sample come from an adjacent watershed, the Shale Hills Critical Zone Observatory. So this is work of Thomas Adler, one of my master's students. And he designed this experiment where he um, took full soil cores and he um, let soil so let solution, laboratory mixed solution percolate, acidification and recovering recovery simulating solutions, and then collected the effluent. And you also look really precisely at the soils there to see what is changing in those soils. So what we found, so these here are his um, um, effluent solution 
data. So in the place that is still having increasing DOC in streams, we also really readily got a lot of DOC out of those soils in our experiments. As opposed to in this place here, we had a much harder time to leaching DOC out of the soils. And looking a closer, taking a closer look at the aggregates, what he found is that when you treated the soils with acidification, like low pH, high ionic strength solutions, aggregates were big, they're all the same scale and uh, magnification. And then if they were treated with a recovery solution, they were substantially smaller, um, up to 50% smaller. So we're thinking this breaking up of the aggregates actually is a big chunk of the, the DOC supply. And uh, for shale hills, we really didn't get a lot of DOC out and also the aggregate sizes were not that different. So that might be one piece to the puzzle. So bringing this back in this idea of having a pattern and looking at the detail and when you zoom into those aggregates, you're really looking at the detail. Um, I think we're sort of here at best. Um, we have a lot of things to do still. There's a lot of different processes that can influence all of this. And um, so there's more iterations to be done. And um, with this, I would like to thank everybody on this team. Um, this is the Stream Doc Posse that's kind of, we gave ourselves that name. Actually, it was Donna Rizzo. She's sitting here. She was like, oh, I was always a geek. I was never, never part of a posse. Let's just make a posse so that we're also cool. And now we are. <laughs> and I also want to thank you for your attention and uh, would be happy to answer any questions.